Welcome to Lead Today with me, Kalina. Let's talk leadership. Hey everyone, welcome to the final episode for now of the travel series. We've gone around the world and we're finalizing the tour with the good old U.S. of A, United States. I, if you could see me on video at the moment, I'm a bit burnt. Um, I spent a bunch of time outside bit of gardening, weed pulling, etc. It had me thinking just about, well, I had a lot on my mind. Not enough. <laughs> so much so that I don't think a single episode could uh, encapsulate all of it. And we'll get to some of that in future episodes in terms of what's on my mind in a deeper sense. But I just thought about how important being outside is. And as a kid, I spent a bunch of time outside playing and obviously didn't really consciously think about its importance but now I've realized just how much time I spend inside on the computer looking at screens and how I don't really want to do that all that much anymore at least if it's not a really worthwhile endeavor which of course this podcast is this brings me so much so much fulfillment and I just want to thank you for for listening um, although in 2020, when I started this project, I really did so just to speak into a void. I, I wasn't really even sure anybody would listen, but I thought that it would be important because I really felt like I lost my voice and that wasn't to convince anyone or to be a voice on my soapbox, but just my means of expression, my creativity, my ability to come up with the biggest, wildest out there idea and see it come to life. And I think when I consider what my vision of the United States is, when I think about the US, I really think about that. I think about people who came together to realize some of their wildest dreams, the American dream, the dream that an individual can achieve whatever they set their mind to, no matter where they come from, you know, race, religion, creed. It's just, if you're willing to do the work and you're willing to show up and serve others, deliver value and build your dream, you can do it. And that's what I grew up seeing about the U.S. and certainly as a Canadian, you know, I saw it as our very big neighbor. And um, that's also, I think, of of importance is, you know, the U.S. is just so vast and huge that it's, it's kind of crazy to do one episode on such a huge, it's almost, it could be a continent in and of itself, like to do an episode about Europe, right? Think about how we talked about how many different areas obviously the U.S. is the same and and really if you're in New York or Miami or California Oregon I mean Texas no matter where you are it can just be it feels like a completely different at least state if not nation every place has its own culture and so I'll do what I can to share a little bit about the places I feel I've spent an adequate amount of time But what I can say overall is the U.S. for me, despite all of its limitations, is a place where anybody can go and still make it, you know, like they talk about New York. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. I think if you can, it's still the land of dreams and the American dream. It's still the place where people go to realize their potential, capitalize on opportunities, build businesses. Um, It's where stars are born and (laughs) moguls are made so I think that's what I I have in my mind when I think of the U.S. is that everything is possible although of course every place has its shadow so where to first I mean where was my first trip I think one of the first places I went to was probably Florida yeah but just because a lot of Canadians travel to Florida it's one of those winter things escape the dark and cold winter people in Canada when it's about February March are just ready to 
fly out of town there's something called a snowbird which is the retired canadians that go down to florida every year might have a condo or a home down there and just um get away from the harsh canadian winter so that is i think where i went first i went with my grandparents i've driven down to florida Ooh, one fun thing was with a friend of mine we just decided it was a very impromptu decision i was i want to say early 20s still a university yeah still in university and it was like okay what are we doing for new year's let's it was i think past christmas like it was definitely kind of in those random days in between christmas and new year's where it just feels like from the 27th to the 31st you just the week it's like a week but it just kind of is it just flies by and it feels sort of like these you're not really you're on school you're you might not be working you might be but if you're not it's just kind of it feels like this bye week where people just sort of veg or <laughs> I guess prepare for the newness of the next next year and and the current one it's definitely what I use that week for is kind of setting intentions I do have um, and wrapping up the current year, which is important. People set a lot of intentions, but they don't wrap up what they've just been through. So that's something to consider. Uh, I have an episode on it somewhere. I did it for, I think for 2022 or 2023. So there's an episode if you're wanting some of that and feel like you're in a new season, doesn't obviously have to be at the end of a calendar year. Uh, you can set, you can set intentions or go through different phases, no matter what time of year it is. Actually, now is a good time too, because summer is ending. And so as summer ends and fall begins, it's a good kind of time to, you know, sort of like spring cleaning, but let's say fall cleaning, get your harvest, um, you know, count those vegetables in your garden, so to speak, count what you have grown, reap what you've sown sort of idea is a good thing now. Um, but yeah, so, so it's almost new year's and it's like what are we gonna do and i remember it was with a friend Lindsay. we just said why don't we drive to miami <laughs> so no real plan i don't even think we booked a place until we were on the road maybe just before we left we booked the hotel and we drove down in her manual diesel volkswagen there we go and uh man was it cold but i just remember it was so beautiful to see like so from Toronto area where it's cold snowing you drive through the border all the northern like Buffalo area is just freezing right lots of snow I remember we took a break somewhere in Pennsylvania like 3 a.m and it was just so cold sitting there on the highway but as you drive down and you go through so let's see you go through which way did we drive I mean there's always more than one way you can go through the Detroit border you can go through the Buffalo like Niagara Falls side I think on that occasion we went through the Buffalo side and it's about 24 hours similar in fact which people don't always know it's a similar drive to Texas I've done that drive as well so maybe we'll talk about that one next but 22 hours 38 minutes Toronto to Miami of course, if you fly, it's like three hours. And that's the same thing if you're if you're flying to Austin, Texas. So everybody always is shocked by that. They're like, what? They think Miami's closer. No, similar drive if you're driving from, or sorry, similar flight and drive. So anyhow, okay, let's see. This thing will load for us. So, I mean, that's what we essentially did was 22 hours. We went through... Why won't this show me what I want? Yeah, so you'll go through Pennsylvania. So we go through Pennsylvania and then down through Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and then into Florida. And as we went down these states, it was just like, take off the big jacket, take off the sweater, take off the boots, take off. And you just feel like, it's such a cool thing because when you fly, obviously you're just instantly or seemingly instantly transported into this new climate because you're there in three hours. But when you drive, it's more gradual. And I have to say, it was just such a, it was such a wonderful thing to experience with a friend. And it was just kind of off we go. And it was this sense of adventure and how fun was that? And so we were there for a weekend. Um, once we got down there, it was like, okay, what are we going to do for new year's? And I just remember, I mean, that was man, <laughs> such a different era of, of life where 
Um, they had parties. There was a party on Star Island. Rick Ross was throwing this thing. You had to send in your picture uh, to make sure that you looked of a certain standard. And then there you go. We had these entrance tickets or whatever it is to uh, Rick Ross's party on Star Island. And who knows who was there? I don't remember exactly who. Like, I don't remember seeing anybody particularly famous. It was his party, but who knows when or if everybody said that they were upstairs on the different level in their own private area, but it was a stunning party. Nonetheless, star Island is um, just its own little thing. When you drive from Miami to go to South beach, there's a, not a highway, but kind of a road that goes from Miami to South beach. And off of that, there's a turn and you've got this little private Island with maybe 10, 15, 20 houses. I don't know, not many. And uh, so it's one of those. And so the backyard has a boat and you're right on the water. And uh, it was just one of those out of a movie kind of nights where, how are we at this? <laughs> how are we at this mansion on Star Island with these people? Like it was, it really was out of a movie. And um yeah, I can't say, you know, the funny thing about nights like that is it is sort of like the hangover, the, you know, the movie where not that I was remarkably intoxicated by any means, um, but I don't remember the intricacies 10 years later. You know what I mean? I mean, maybe it's not exactly 10 years later, but you just kind of have these snippets of memories. And it's a funny thing about life is, of course, if you take pictures or videos of things you have a you can recall them better because you can go back and watch actual footage of an event but it's funny what sticks out in your mind like this one room with these green lights kind of I I guess it was meant to look kind of like a club and then there's this huge bottle of champagne and uh people were pouring everyone drinks out of this huge like half the height of me (laughs) Uh, size bo- size bottle it was massive so that sticks out in my mind and there's a picture of Lindsay holding that so that's something I remember then after we left I remember we were walking by the by the ocean and just on the beach and met some other girls at that party and they they were going elsewhere I think we went to live maybe bunch of nightclubs the interesting thing about Miami in comparison to Vegas like somehow I felt treated better as a woman in Miami like it was just I mean you get in free everywhere but yeah I guess I guess you get in for free at all locations in Vegas too but it just seemed to be more kind of I had more fun I think in Miami than in Vegas but Uh, I guess it depends which occasion I've been. So I've been to Miami maybe four or five times. I've been to Vegas three times, four. Yeah. Mm. So I guess I've been there both (laughs) equal amount of times. Vegas just feels kind of like Disneyland. It doesn't feel real. Whereas Miami, I think because South Beach, yes, it's its own kind of little area. It has this strip of beach. South beach is where all the partying kind of happens. If you go further up, it's interesting. There's like a very Jewish community, Hasidic Jews that live in North beach. Um, that's, I have, I think I recorded an episode about that too. Just so interesting. It's very family oriented. I think that's the difference in Vegas. Like I've stayed, I stayed in Vegas. I was at a friend's place and, um, staying there they do have residential obviously outside of the strip but unless you know somebody that lives in vegas like vegas is really just the strip or of course you can go and like see the grand canyon and do that bit which i've never done oddly enough um but somehow vegas just does feel like this strip in the desert you know um it feels very kind of like adult disney world and somehow the old world charm of vegas has also changed like it just feels very kind of commercial and I mean so is Miami and obviously if you go to a club you're going to get a club experience like a club is a club is a club you have day party pool parties where people are just you know DJs and doing their thing I think it's more grand potentially in Vegas so maybe that's a good distinguishing factor in Vegas you'll get kind of like big big tall hotels and big pools 
and it feels more grand. Whereas Miami, the pool might be a bit smaller. Um, and so the scale of it, it like even the buildings, everything in South Beach, like they're a bit shorter than what you get in Vegas. But then in that case, like you feel like you're in this exclusive kind of hideaway and you're not in a big corporate setting. So that's maybe the difference. Like Miami, the buildings are a bit shorter. You've got, of course, like huge condos and, and bigger buildings on the strip, but it's you've got the residential mix. It feels more like a city. The, the pool parties aren't as big. And so it, it has a different feeling to it when you're in South Beach. Yeah. And there's such a Cuban influence and lots of Hispanic influence as well from Mexico and, and other countries. Puerto Rico, of course, is part of the U.S., but there's it's a unique flair. So there are people from there as well. It's certainly a huge Cuban influence in Miami and you feel it. And that's also different, I think, from Las Vegas. So anyhow, uh, there we were. And <laughs> it's kind of this like 72 hour trip and we drove back up hearts content tanned and um I guess ready to take on the new year so that was a fun very impromptu new year's adventure that I wouldn't trade for the world and I think it just speaks to the sense of adventure that I felt at that age but that I think we often lose with time and I get it if you you know you get married or you have kids you've got responsibilities that idea of let's just pick up and go on a 24 hour drive down to Miami might not be as practical but I wonder how we can bring more of that into our lives you know it doesn't have to be a huge road trip somewhere else but I think we forget that that spontaneity that fun sense of adventure and and just lightheartedness that can be so revivifying when I think we do it regularly. I mean, it, it's revivifying, even if you haven't done it in a long time. But that that it just brings you this sense of youth. That and what's youth? Why do we prize youth? Well, it's this vitality. It's this excitement for life. It's energy. It's health. It is vitality? I mean, I don't know what. Right in a sense, like if you can move and not only move, but it's this spirit of youth that. I think we can regain at any age and we sometimes limit ourselves. Oh, I'm 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 70. So now I should be doing this, 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 I should be at this stage. And I think there's reason for that. And it's not okay. Obviously seeing a 70 year old in Vegas, having the time of his life. Well, why not? <laughs> uh, but you know, there, of course, time and a place and there are phases for a reason, but I don't think it means we should shut off the valve to that life force that really is so exciting. And so maybe you don't drive down to Miami this weekend or for New Year's, but maybe you go on an impromptu road trip somewhere else or you do something in an afternoon that you normally wouldn't do. I think that's what travel gives to me no matter where I go is it's this change of scenery, which gives me a new lease on life because it's a new perspective on how people live or what a place looks like the cuisine it's it brings out curiosity in a way that being in a known environment doesn't and so I love to cultivate that and I think I mean if you are American and you live there then certainly it's so I I mean I've been to how many states I don't know at least at least 20 I feel like that's right with all the driving I've done. Cause like I said, I've done the Toronto to Miami, Toronto to Austin, Texas. I don't know if it's 20, I could count, <laughs> but there's just so many climates. I mean, even Hawaii, like if you've uh, being there for my 30th birthday, that's a tropical Island, completely different from, you know, being in Texas, and even Miami, even Florida, you know, Florida has that tropical vibe, but an island is just so different. And I haven't been to Puerto Rico and I have not been to Alaska. And those two, I'm sure, are also unique in their own right and worth a visit. Although I can't vouch for them myself. But I think it's so interesting when you just see different corners of a nation and certainly being in the north of California, you know, San Francisco and north into Napa is such a different feeling from Miami, which is a different feeling from Austin. Austin is interesting. They say, you know, keep it surrounded. Austin is this kind of 
blue city in a red state, as they say. So very open-minded, very democratic, which means, well, openness is meant to be high. Although in the current political landscape, I don't know. I think it's tough to characterize any set of people with any given set of characteristics because every individual has their own levels of openness and extroversion, willingness to experience new things, right? New ideas. I don't know if you can, I don't know. It's hard to give people a group definition, but anyhow, Austin as a city is meant to be open and progressive and Texas as a state is meant to be conservative and traditional. And so you really feel that in Austin, there's a lot of technological innovation. A lot of tech companies are there. Texas is a favorable state for businesses. Um, Austin is super special because in the hill country, you've really got these beautiful hills. There's like Travis and um, if you drive further north and you go to Dallas or even in between Austin and Dallas, it's very flat and you've got lots of fields. And so hill country really is kind of this unique thing in Texas because there's a lot of sort of hay colored grass, flat fields, and it's just rolling, sprawling for miles and miles. Um, and Austin gives you this kind of hilled landscape that's that's different and unique. And it's, it's really quite special. I, I like it there. Um, but so that drive is also unique and fun where if you go, um, you can also go through Buffalo, but don't have to, you can also go through Detroit side of the border. So you'll go through Michigan, maybe Ohio or Illinois or Indiana down through Kentucky, Tennessee, um, Mississippi, Louisiana into Texas or, um, Arkansas into Oklahoma into Texas. So I've kind of been I've driven through all those states. Um, oh, I did a road trip once to Indianapolis as well to watch a Colts football game. That was a fun trip as well. The roads were all flooded. It had rained and it was like super flooded. But that was a fun experience. I think anybody that, even if you're not super into football, I just think it's, football is such an institution in the US. Football and basketball, of course. You know, the NBA and NFL are just huge leagues. Obviously the NHL too. And hockey's a big deal in the Northern states. So if you're into hockey, but that's it's a Canada thing. <laughs> Maybe I'm showing my uh, Canadian colors by saying that, but I don't know. I think Canadians have the the hockey market cornered, even if, uh, and most of the players that are Canadian go and play on American teams and you got Europeans playing too. So anyhow, uh, I think you can catch a really good football game and Texans absolutely are big on football. And I mean, all the South, but Texas just, takes it to another level and Austin doesn't have an NFL team, but they've got, um, so they're really big on college football. That's another thing like college football and, or high school football. Some of those small towns, high school football is no joke. People take that very seriously. It is not just in the, you know, Friday night lights kind of movie series show TV show or whatever. Like it's, it's a real thing. You do not mess with football. <laughs> so uh, Dallas has Dallas Cowboys. You can go to them. I actually went to another game also where San Francisco, I think it was the 49ers versus the Ravens. I want to say, do I have that right? Yeah. San Francisco didn't win, but that was, that was actually my first NFL uh, game. My first football game was in San Francisco. And that was a fun time too, even though they lost, it's just one of those things where you tailgate, you really do get like the all American beer and hot dogs, hamburgers, People load up their trucks. They're hanging out in the parking lot. People are drunk before the game even starts. Uh, but there's this very jovial community kind of, we're all in this together kind of spirit, of course, against our adversaries, which are the opposing team. If you go and cheer for the opposing team at a game, good luck to you if you wear the wrong jersey. Uh, but, you know, it's it's a good time. And hockey definitely does that for Canadians. And I think there's something to it. There's something unifying about sports. And we see it even with when there's, um you know, the World Cup for soccer or football if you're European. You know, there's something really nice about what sports can do to bring people together. Of course, it can <laughs> cause arguments. Like I probably told you in a previous episode about, I think it was in the Brazil episode when I was in Argentina, that was the most somber I've ever seen a collective group of people when Argentina lost to Chile in the Copa final. Oh my goodness. The streets of Buenos Aires were like, <laughs> it was like the president died, you know, it was just so somber. Everyone was in the streets, hats in hand, just absolutely devastated. And 
yeah, that's another South America and their soccer, man. That is not a joke. So anyhow, if you want to catch a football game, definitely all American thing to do and grab your hot dog and hamburger or your beer and soak up the sun while you're outside watching a game. Um, Nashville, Tennessee, nice town, music town. You've got that one strip with kind of some rock and roll and live music. Austin's got a strip just like that. I think one thing to point out that was so sad was being on sixth street in Austin, just seeing a level of homelessness. It really is no joke. I mean, California's dealing with the same. It's all over. The interesting thing is parts of Europe. I've done extensive research on this because I saw it one night we were out, um, going to see some live music and I was just so taken aback and devastated by how many like people just walk by homeless individuals and don't flinch. Like it's, we're, we're just so, I guess, numb to it or used to it. I'm not really sure. And since like, there's just no sensitivity to that, um, at least where I was that day. And, you know, it's a really hustling, bustling kind of area with lots of live music and things and just lots of homeless people sitting around laying on the street and no one has anything to say or to stop or to do anything. I mean, what do you really do? I guess is that follow-up question, but that's something that breaks my heart that I see in Toronto as well. And it skyrocketed um, going out in Toronto the other evening it was also devastating. I talked to a security guard at a, a, beside a shelter that wasn't there when I was growing up and now it is and just line up and refugees coming from taxis straight from the airport to this shelter and so that's confusing too is refugees are getting sent to a shelter that are also that's also used for people that are really struggling with mental health issues and or drug addiction or or like it's it's quite stark the contrast between somebody that shows up with their suitcase in hand they look you know put together and someone else that has a shopping cart with tattered clothes and really is is just not not present to reality for whatever reason, um, whether again, it's a mental health issue or, or substance abuse or usage. So this isn't, that was, I stood there and talked with this gentleman for at least two hours and just saw the coming and comings and goings of, um, you know, downtown Toronto and, and how it's changed. It used to be that corner. Um, it's near, where is it near? It's like Peter and Adelaide. There used to be a bar, maybe it was one street north of Adelaide. Yeah, one street north. What is that, Richmond? Maybe Richmond and Peter. Um, yeah, it used to be this bar and it had palm trees. I remember it was on the second floor and it had these palm trees and people would go and hang out. And it was such a lively place over the weekend. I don't think I'd ever actually been there in particular, but I'd walked by there so many times and it was always just a fun place. And now it just has this very dark, very different energy. It's almost cold. Like the windows are boarded up because um, if they don't board them up, then people break the glass. Apparently like it's just changed so much. And it, it was heartbreaking to see how, you know, this, I mean, my city, Toronto's not my city, but you know, you grow up somewhere and just to see how it's changed for the worse is um really quite sad. And, and it was such a shocking truth to to witness and I really just had to stand there and I was shocked I, I have nothing else to say so anyway uh I I can't um I don't have a solution although places like Switzerland um also Norway have some companies and and or initiatives from the government that have done a brilliant job to tackle homelessness um also interesting is of course the scale right so Switzerland has a population of around 8 million of the whole country but then I say to myself okay if Switzerland can tackle it then why can't you know a city like Toronto or a city like Austin or a city like Houston or a city like Dallas why can't on a municipal level we implement similar strategies to tackle this issue um this isn't meant to be a this isn't meant to be a you know social issues commentary but I it's just I would feel so silly to ignore something that's so blatantly in your face when you go to these places in all major cities i definitely noticed it in san francisco and that's become even more apparent as well as in los angeles and certainly new york i mean the last time in new york is probably 2021 yeah 2021 2022 mm, don't remember 2022 maybe but flying through there um out of costa rica costa rica 
I always have an issue with pronouncing it. Like I, to me, you'd say Costa Rica, but then people say Costa Rica and I'm like, I don't know, because I feel like in Spanish, they say Costa Rica. Like anyway, but <laughs> flying through and just seeing Times Square and like people literally shooting up with heroin in Times Square was shocking to me when it used to just, I mean, lots of cops, but the cops aren't doing anything and smell of urine. Again, Times Square, just when I first went, maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe more than that um but it was just this like larger than life spot and now it just feels again this kind of coldness and i had this it's just this like sense of despair like this gem that's just been somehow eroded it's it's really quite a different feeling at least for me at least from what it was 10 years ago to now which is again you know we've made so much progress in so many ways and so to see these kind of landmark places like toronto new york san francisco la dallas you know to see them rife with homelessness and drug abuse it's it's really sad um and i just wonder what we could do but anyhow maybe there's a future episode on that topic and maybe i can find somebody that's actually doing something about it and maybe i can help and who knows? But that is definitely something that really pulls on my heartstrings and I, I spend mental energy thinking about. So, all right. Austin, also huge music scene. I'd say Tennessee has a different flair because they do get some snow in the winter. And so you've kind of got, it's a bit more green. Even if you look at the map of the United States, there's this line, this invisible line that kind of runs through North, South Dakota, Oklahoma, Texas, all the way down and so anything kind of west of dallas west of austin west of san antonio it looks kind of desert like you know when you get into new mexico arizona utah nevada southern california and new mexico it looks white or beige on the map because the vegetation is just remarkably less and apparently 80 percent of the u.s population or something close to that lives east of this hypothetical line that runs through those states that I mentioned just kind of north south runs down and so the, most of the vegetation is on the east of that and then most of the people live east of that and so people that live in California are the exception of course anyone living in all the states Wyoming Idaho Oregon Washington Montana New Mexico Arizona Utah all those states you know or western Texas western Oklahoma um are an exception to the rule. And so that's interesting. There's also tornado alley that runs through Oklahoma, Texas kind of comes down. And, um, that was an interesting thing spending some time in Dallas. It's actually probably the reason I could never live in Dallas full time was, and I know that it can happen in Austin and it certainly can happen in Houston as well. Cause Houston's got that hurricane risk. So the Gulf of Mexico, you've got to be careful you get hurricanes swirling up from there. Of course, Louisiana gets hit with those. Florida gets hit with those usually on the West coast of Florida. That's why it was actually, I think a few months ago, I got hit twice. Um, but so that's, you know, Gulf of Mexico has to deal with, with that force of nature. Um, but being in Dallas and one morning, 7am, the phone starts blaring off and it's like, what is that? And it's showing a tornado warning. And I had never, you know, I didn't grow up with that. I had no idea kind of what what's the deal what's the severity do we have to hide what is it in it you know the instructions are to go into the innermost room of your house um and so we did that and we're sitting there and it's like okay let's go to the main building and so we went there to like the main amenities center and kind of went again inland and, and it wasn't actually that big of a deal like all things at the end of the day all things considered like where we were in keller texas this tornado passed away from the area and everything was good but i mean everything wasn't good for everyone else i don't know how many homes got damaged from it um, i don't think anyone died on that particular occasion but it was just this feeling of really not being safe from a not from this natural event that could occur at any moment i mean i grew up with snow and i can handle you know snow coming my way big snowstorm i know what to deal with um, how to deal with it or what to expect. And this was just so out there for me. And it was really kind of, I just didn't feel safe because I potentially wasn't, again, it wasn't as bad as it could have been. And I think that of course those sirens were precautionary, but just the fact that there are sirens installed outside, I don't know, couldn't, couldn't, uh, couldn't reckon with that to feel safe. Like one day I had meetings, it was like 
the first Wednesday of the month or something. And every first Wednesday they test these sirens and there's sirens all around the city in Dallas to alert you if there's a tornado or some kind of, you know, flooding, potential flooding or any kind of event. It's usually tornado or, or thunderstorm inclement weather. And I'm telling you, uh, when they tested this, I just, I had no idea they were testing it. And I, <laughs> I freaked out again. I'm like, what? what is this? Are we going to be okay? Like what's going on? And so I looked it up and they were just testing, but I'm telling you, like some of these storms in Texas are just wicked. I've never seen anything like it green. The sky is like a gray green and it just looks like the apocalypse. It looks like the world just might end. And I've never seen a storm like that. Texas has some wicked summer storms. So that's, (laughs) there's another potential cautionary measure. Although we're hearing now about wildfires in different places and uh, Toronto area in Quebec, we're dealing with some wildfire issues and air quality issues. So no one's exempt, but that was kind of one of those first experiences where I felt like Dorothy, you know, it's like, am I going to get swept up in a tornado and the house is going to go up and <laughs> into the wind, into the dust or what? So it was just very scary to me because I didn't know what to expect or deal with and perhaps if you've grown up there most of the people that have grown up there just have these like emergency preparedness kits and they kind of just know to go under the stairs but again that wasn't something I grew up with or grew up with having to think about and so it just felt really scary because we didn't have to do that one thing I can think of growing up though was um in uh in the summer, I remember being up at a cottage and the power going out. And so being without power up there for a few days, wasn't that big of a deal, but I just remember it was just like big blackout. I haven't had anything like that since then, but so that's at least 15 years ago, if not more. Uh, but that was kind of a scary moment in Toronto area where power went out. It was summertime or definitely not cold. Um, but people were wondering about their food going bad and things. And it was like a couple of days, at least the power was restored depending on where you were. So that was kind of a moment of that. But other than that, I never really experienced that in my lifetime, which is just so lucky. If you think about it, I've, I've lived such a, such a relatively easy existence compared to people that deal with typhoon season every year in parts of Asia or hurricane season or flooding. Um, you know, I mean, we get snow and we shovel it. <laughs> I, I'm simplifying a bit. Of course, it's dangerous to dry in snow, drive in snowstorms. Snow can cause absolutely great amounts of damage if it's a bad storm. But anyhow, I don't know why I'm getting into the serious elements of this. But just to say we're not, uh, no place is immune to natural phenomenon. And consider that when you're traveling, I suppose. But, oh, if you're going to drive. Another one is the PCH, that one highway along the coast of California. They got Big Sur. You can just go literally either San Diego all the way up or San Francisco or Napa and go all the way down, whatever you want, but you just can't go wrong. The sweeping views, it's out of this world. I think there are parts of Europe, like if you drive the coast of Croatia or the south of France, you might have some rivaling views for sure there, but man, if there's a coast that you should drive, the PCH is it in California. And you can just stop at any one of the coastal towns and be blown away by the beautiful beachside homes and little boardwalks and things. You got Santa Monica Pier, classic. So I spent a good amount of time in the Bay Area and that's nice. Um, You have a lot of you know, suburban living. I don't know. San Francisco is kind of like the nights. It, there wasn't like a party scene like Miami or Vegas or New York where you're out really late. Like it, San Francisco kind of ends early, at least when, when I went out there, it wasn't like a late night thing and a bit more low key. The techies, I guess, or I don't know, maybe I missed, <laughs> maybe I missed the scene and where everybody was at, but it wasn't as wild as as uh, Vegas or Miami or, or New York gets. New York is just a thing of its own, you know. I think Toronto tries to be mini New York or New York's cousin. New York just has this really cool vibe, you know. Like it's these underground bars and speakeasies. The clubs just feel all underground, even if they're huge. Like it's this different kind of city grunge feeling. Um, not all of them, obviously, you have high end spots and. <laughs> But there's just something, something grunge about New York, in my opinion, compared to like that 
outdoor Latino vibe that you get in Miami or that kind of big box hotel larger than life in a very manufactured paradise in the desert kind of feeling of Vegas. So um, all worthwhile places, New York, you'll eat amazing food, whether you go to little holes in the wall, street food, or you go to the best of the best, you'll definitely find any culinary interest you have in your mind there. So that's worthwhile. Um, I've never been to Maine or New Hampshire, any of that. And I think that'd be interesting. I know Maine's really well known for oysters. <laughs> so I haven't done any of those states up there. Um, I imagine they resemble kind of the New Brunswick PEI Nova Scotia thing in Canada, but I can't be sure. I haven't been there, but that's an interesting part of the states I haven't experienced. Um, Chicago, been to Chicago a few times with some with some girlfriends and that was that was interesting i think it's similar similar vibe to toronto they have a nice ferris wheel and you got to get deep dish pizza in chicago and but something that's lovely is if you do a boat tour there and you there the architecture is just beautiful if you're into if like frank lloyd wright um he, he's got a home there and he designed a lot of the buildings so that's worthwhile if you're into architecture for sure they have some really unique buildings and they've done a great job of kind of maintaining and continuing on that tradition of unique buildings. So definitely go ahead and, and visit Chicago if you're an architecture buff or want kind of an interesting city experience. If you want deep dish pizza, if you're kind of into like a city experience. It's certainly an interesting, unique city. Um, I'll be in Seattle later this year for the memorable book tour. So haven't seen Seattle just yet. I've got a lot of worked with a lot of people based out of Seattle so interested to meet some of them in person, the individuals that I haven't met just yet. Um, and I think, you know, that'll be an interesting spot too. Uh, it might be similar to Vancouver in Canada, in Canada, <laughs> Canada, I'm not too sure. That's my estimation just because of the proximity, but that'll be interesting. I'll have to report back on how it goes in Seattle. But if you're, if you're in the Seattle area and wanting to get together in person, that'll be end of September. So love for you to join us there. That's my little one, two. Oh, I didn't mention Louisiana. I probably should. Louisiana is cool. You've got to go to new Orleans. Although I will say like pre post COVID the vibe shifted, at least for me, I was there pre and post COVID. And I don't know, again, this kind of heavy energy that I didn't feel when I was in NOLA, but they've got a really cool, like French quarters and you got to get cafe du monde coffee and some beignet. That'll be something there's crawfish, etouffee, Southern cooking, just like French Creole, you've got this like amazing style of cooking that really just embodies like you get gumbo and shrimp. Like it's just, it is out of a movie. Like if you've ever watched a movie about the South and Louisiana, just you absolutely step into that reality so wholeheartedly. The senses, like everything you smell, taste, touch, see there just is out of a movie. At least to me, it was just so picturesque in many ways. And the cuisine was absolutely flavorful and unique. So definitely a spot if you're ready to eat, try new things. It's very hot if you're going to go in the summer. So be ready for that. But man, it's it's a worthwhile spot. It's interesting. The French influence there and that Creole kind of you've got the like African culture as well. And it's a fascinating, fascinating mix up of, of people. And um, I think it's a worthwhile spot to note. So there we go. North South Carolina, a lot of like suburban. It's just like, it feels like a nice place to live. <laughs> I, I, that's my impression of North and South Carolina. You got these like cities with just really cookie cutter homes that are just feels like safe. You know, you've got like, I don't know, Tommy and Mike playing baseball <laughs> on the street. That's what I feel like driving through North and South Carolina. It's not all of it. Charlotte's a cool city, obviously, but just the suburbs. Like, and of course, there's extreme poverty all over the US. The South in particular is impacted by, you know, really some people that are struggling. It's not always an easy thing. And you can see that it's fascinating to me. Like, you don't get this as much in Canada. Like, you can be driving on a decently nice street in the US and you go down another street and it's like trailers and it looks really like a lot of dilapidated homes. Same thing in Houston, actually driving down from Conroy, Houston. If you drive down, so you're staying north of the city, there's some 
the Woodlands, which is like this very famed master plan community. I think it came out around the eighties or so. Um, really nice kind of cookie cutter, beautiful homes. But then you drive down into Houston and along the highway, I was shocked at how many homes just looked boarded up. I don't know if it's from hurricane damage or what, but I mean, it had been years since the hurricane, the, the last big hurricane, but it just seems like people did not have the means to to fix things up. So that's an interesting thing that you do have this disparity between, um, you know, the socioeconomic classes that you really feel it's not as stark as being in Brazil, for example, where you really have favela versus just stunning huge hotel on the beach in Rio kind of thing. Um, but sometimes it kind of is like, sometimes there is that disparity of really, really dilapidated homes and or mobile homes that look like they're on their last legs. Um, you know, not too far away from these eight, 900,000 million dollar homes that are facing the lake and definitely saw that in Dallas, you know, on, on the East side of Dallas, around Forney, Texas, like you'll get these really beautiful homes. If you drive a little bit, it's like these trailer park communities and not that there's anything wrong with a trailer park necessarily, but sometimes they really look run down and, and rough. And so it depends. Um, but that's an interesting thing that I noticed as well, particularly in the South, but certainly even if you drive on that drive, let's say from Toronto down through to Texas, so Illinois, Indiana, et cetera, and certainly through North, South Carolina, Georgia, for sure. And into, into Florida, same thing. Florida's got a lot of older kind of homes that could use some love. And so interesting, just interesting to see the mix up of a lot of wealth, very developed McDonald's, Starbucks. That's another thing kind of different from Europe, although Europe's getting there with all the big companies sort of coming in, but highway exit after highway exit of target and walmart target and walmart costco and walmart and you just keep that was another thing that kind of got me where and not that canada is necessarily all that different you got walmart after walmart too but that was something that it's comforting and reassuring in a way because no matter what state you're in you kind of know that you can find that starbucks or walmart or mcdonald's you have those kind of iconic brands but at the same time I think that's the allure or appeal of Europe is that you have a bit more of that small town boutique little cafe or hotel restaurant locally owned. And there's a lot of entrepreneurship and a lot of that in the U S and I just hope that that American dream on an individual level remains because that main street of every town is such a nice feature. And that's definitely something Texas has on lock is those beautiful little town squares with a church and some nice shops, restaurants, ice cream, and you can just go for a stroll. And so a lot, a lot of little Texas towns have that is that strip. And I think there's something to it. And I really value that. I value the, the American dream, the American dream of any guy can, any guy or gal can open up shop and and make something of themselves. And so I think that's still there. There's a lot of that big corporate interest and big, big brand, big casino, big hotel, big McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King kind of thing going on. Um, but I think there's still, still space for the little guy. So anyway, I hope that continues because what it's what makes New York, Miami and, and, you know, Nashville and all all these little little and big towns really I think so enchanting is when you go in and you see some shop owner and they tell you their story and they've got these unique goods or artisan products food from a local farm there's just there's something so nice about it because it's what makes a region interesting right I mean what if you had if you just went from McDonald's to McDonald's all along the coast from Toronto all the way to Texas or Florida or California if you just drove through and only got to eat at McDonald's all the way through. I mean, what fun is that, right? Like we love to go and stop and see places that have great reviews on Google and like family owned, I don't know, truck stops with like the best barbecue ever in this, like beside a gas station. And you're just floored by the fact that you found the best barbecue ever <laughs> at this random, random, like what's one of them? I think like Slovak, Slovaks or something is one of them. Like they've just got these random, that's another thing is these things called kolachi, which in Croatian kolachi means cookies. And so it is kind of a cookie, but I think it's a Hungarian flair. So you'll get some of those if you're in Texas. Oh, and I would get in so much trouble if I didn't mention Bucky's, which is 
this institution of a gas station in Texas. Really, it's just a huge gas station with this beaver as a mascot. Um, I think it's the biggest gas station in the world is, is one of those buckies along, uh, along the interstate highway, but you go in and it's like just a grocery store. It's, it's almost, I mean, it's got clothes and everything you could possibly imagine. So <laughs> that's an interesting side note is this culture gas gas station culture of the South, um, Bucky's in particular, it's a unique feature, but yeah, I don't know. I'm, I've got mixed feelings of, I love that you can pop into a Walmart and know what you're getting, but at the same time, there's just something so beautiful about the shop around the corner on main street and wherever USA that you just go in and meet a guy and hear about how he's lived his life out in this small town and he's doing his thing. So there's a little bit of everything for you in the U S whether you like small town charm or big city living for sure. And you've got coast to coast, just amazing food, wildlife, fascinating landscapes. You've got like the mountains of the West. You can go into Colorado and see some beautiful mountains, have some good skiing. You could be at the beach in Miami or in Hawaii you can go to the North and in Alaska and see that, um, have that Cape Cod feeling or go to Boston and get that feel. It's just something on my list for sure. Um, or you can head into Texas and have some of the best brisket you've ever seen. So a little bit of something for everyone. It's certainly just, there's so much more to discover. I'm certainly not done with that country as a whole, uh, but definitely a worthwhile visit, I would say. So not that I'm getting paid, but, you know, add it to your list, I think, and and certainly go off the beaten track, you know, like a lot of people do those big, big cities that I've mentioned, and they're worthwhile and fun, but why not do a road trip and check out some random town you hadn't heard of before. So hope this has been fun for you. I know we went, it's always a winding road, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but I hope to see you next time. This does conclude, as I said, our travel series for now. But uh, I'm sure I'll be back with more fun adventure stories and travel stories down the line. I've got so many I haven't shared with you yet. So I'm sure I'll be back. And another reminder that you've got the memorable book tour continuing, might be coming to a city near you. And I'd love it if you grabbed a copy of Memorable. The audiobook is on its way. I'm, I'm working on it. It's taking me a little longer than I thought to narrate 300 pages. So bear with me while I get that completed. But um grab a paperback, check it out, join us for a live event date at a Barnes and Noble or Indigo Canada near you. And really hope to see you come out and love to chat with people when they come out and say hi. So hope to see you there and I'll uh, catch you on the next episode of the show where we'll deep dive into, I think some interesting concepts. And uh, we do have a very special guest coming down the pipeline none other than Mr. Robert Green, who is an absolute legend in my opinion. He wrote 48 Laws of Power, Art of Seduction, Mastery. He is an absolute master himself, I think, in not only writing, but conveying human nature, the human condition in, in a compelling and very thorough fashion. So hope you'll catch that episode coming up soon. Lots Lots of interesting stuff actually coming out the gate in the next few weeks. So stick with me, check it out. And as always, please reach out. I love to hear from you guys. Like it's, I, I know I'm speaking into the void and I love just talking and having you hear it. But if you've got something to say or you have a comment or there's content that you want, I mean, I love hearing about it. So hope to, hope to catch you in an episode soon and take good care until then. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen to this episode today. It really helps the show when you like, review, subscribe, or donate to support the effort to continue producing amazing episodes just like this one. I look forward to seeing you again in another episode very soon, and take good care until then.